Uh, welcome, this is the session on Apponomics. And what we're going to do in this session is explore the economies of the mobile app stores. Uh, a bit of history first. So I currently work for a startup based out of Atlanta, Georgia called Triplingo. We build foreign language learning apps on the iPhone, Android, and various other markets. Uh, and before I founded this startup, uh, about a year and a half ago, I spent some time doing some research. And we're continuously doing research to understand the mobile app space and to get a good idea of how we should position our own products. Uh, and I also consult for other folks to help them understand uh, how they should position their products, marketing, and other things around that. And that's what this session is about. OK? So without further ado, Steps to Getting Rich 2012 edition. Right? Everyone has probably seen this, or maybe some of you have attempted this. No, step one, develop a mobile app. <laughs> step two, dot, dot, dot. Step three, profit. Right? Uh, and in the case of some folks, uh, like um, OMG Pop uh, or Instagram, you profit hugely. So unfortunately, that's not the, uh, the way things really work in the mobile app space. It's a, very, it's a very crowded market, and there's a lot that you have to understand to be able to enter it successfully. Uh, one quick disclaimer before I go forward, though. Uh, this presentation is for entertainment purposes only. Okay, you'd be crazy to base a business just on the contents of this session. Do your own homework. Uh, but hopefully this will give you a good starting point to start thinking about all the different things that you would need to look at and understand to be able to jump into the mobile app space. All right, first, let's talk about the, quickly talk about the, the various app stores. Uh, there's a bunch of them, as most of you know. Uh, the primary ones are the iOS and Android stores, the iOS, uh, the, the Apple App Store, and the Android uh, Google Play Store. Uh, but there, there are a bunch of new ones coming out, such as the Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, the BlackBerry 10, and the, the big one that was just announced this week was the Windows Phone market. Okay, it's been around for a while, but Windows Phone 8 has just come out. Uh, so this is something that we're very interested in as well. All right. So uh, one thing I like to say is that a lot of people hear about apps that do really well. Uh, and a lot of times, the apps that do really well uh, are, get featured on one of these app stores, usually on the iOS or Google Play Store. Right? But, but this is as much a lottery ticket as it is anything else. How and when an app gets picked for one of these stores is unknown. Uh, and uh, nobody really knows the mechanism by which these things, yeah, your application gets picked and put onto one of these stores. Um, but the other thing is, is that it has a huge upside, but typically only lasts about a week. Okay? Uh, but during that time, from the research that I've done and the, the folks that I've spoken to who build apps uh, for these various stores, they see a huge increase in their the volume of downloads and obviously in sales. Okay? And one thing that we've tried to capitalize on at Triplingo is that we've tried to capitalize each time we've been featured as a gateway to longer term success. So we've been featured on the iOS store about a dozen different times. And I'll talk about how we've been able to do that. Um, we don't really know, but I'm going to give you some pointers that may help you understand how getting featured or how to get featured. OK. Uh, so just to kind of show you graphically what the app ranking versus sales is, if you're in the top 10, typically what we've seen is this is, you know, this, uh, these numbers have been uh, sanitized a little bit. Uh, but if you're in the top 10, we see 1,000. And then if you're in the top 20, you drop off maybe about 20% or so. Uh, from uh, being in the top 10. And then it's a very, very steep decline as you go into the 30, 40, and 50, top 30, 40, and 50 range. All right, And uh, the, the reason for this is actually quite simple. Most consumers don't click through past the first 10 or the first 20 tops, grossing, featured, whatever apps there may be. So the drop off is actually quite steep. Um, but it, obviously, being anywhere in the top 50 is a boon if you're an app developer. All right, so we already talked about you know, what, what, your, what does your current business plan look like? Does it look like this? Um, the unfortunate reality of it is that uh, everybody's heard of Angry Birds, which is made by a company out of Finland called Rovio. Uh, they built 50 apps for the App Store. And uh, after that, they made a huge hit with Angry Birds. And now they're, you know, they're basically a multi-billion dollar company. Um, if we look at OMG Pop, the guys who do Draw Something, they spent $17 million in 3.5 years, and then they hit a hit with Draw Something. They'd done a bunch of games, utilities, you name it, a bunch of different things. They'd taken investment money uh, and 
until they hit it big, withdraw something, they, um, you know, they, they basically were on the verge of collapsing uh, because they spent all $17 million in almost four years. Okay, and what's interesting now is that draw something is not really a huge app. It's not making even a fraction of what it was making at the height of its uh, popularity. Okay, uh, but part of the reason for this is that there's over half a million apps on the App Store, and one sobering fact is that almost 60% of apps don't even break even. Okay, and this includes people who spend a minimal amount of out-of-pocket money and just develop the apps on their own or whatever it may be. Uh, and the other problem is that copycats. Uh, if you have a popular app like some kind of, uh, let's say, Bill Reminder app, what happens is once you start breaking into the top 50, 20, 10, whatever it may be, there are shops all over the world that say, it's a really popular app called you know, Remind Me Later or something. And they will go and they will make an almost duplicate app that will show up in a few weeks on the store that cannibalizes your sales. So uh, trying, to, trying to get the popular apps can be very difficult, but talk a bit more about um, uh, how you can avoid things like this if we have time. Uh, but you know, saying that, even though you know, these sober facts may lead you to say, well, I should probably go do something else, there is huge opportunity here. And almost everybody will tell you that we're just at the tip of the iceberg with this. The whole landscape is shifting. So you have to ask yourself, if I'm going to build an app or if I'm going to change my business to, to do mobile apps or incorporate a mobile app as part of my business, it's very, very early still in, in this whole race. So uh, there, there are huge success stories that are out there. They're, they're huge and small success stories, to be honest with you. So it is, a, it is a market worth exploring, even with all the drawbacks and the intense competition, right? It's one of those things. You have to be in the game to, to play it to win it. All right. So um, when we started Triplingo, we said, how can we build a sustainable business? And how, what platforms are we going to support in terms of the different app stores that are out there? So um, actually, I don't have time to talk too much about marketing. Uh, if we have time, we'll talk about that later. But let's talk about um, the different app stores and pricing strategies and other things around that very quickly. What we see is, and this is a quote taken off of Twitter, is that people will pay $4 for a, a coffee that took 30 seconds to make, but they'll spend hours researching a $1 app before buying it. Okay? So this is the kind of consumer mentality that we have to deal with as app developers and app development companies. Or even if you already have sustainable business, how do you grow that business into the app space? This is something that you have to take into account in terms of pricing strategies. Um, and this is a good place to do a small rant on Android, okay? Because pricing has everything to do with how much uh, money and resources you put into building your product to begin with. So when we test on iOS, we basically test on this. We test on an iPhone 4. And we have about, even with the new iPhone 5, probably about 95% insurance that it's going to work across all the other uh, iDevices, whether it's an iPod Touch, uh, iPhone 3GS, iPhone 4, 4S, now the iPhone 5, iPad 1, 2, and 3, and the soon to be coming out iPad mini. Okay? This is what testing on Android looks like. Okay, you guys have probably seen this picture. Uh, we don't have this many devices, but we test on about seven different Android devices. And, and, and uh, the, the reason to discuss this and show this picture is that doing the testing and then the follow-up tweaking and bug fixes and whatever on Android, it takes time. And if you're not building it yourself, or even if you are building it yourself, it costs money to do something like that, right? It costs a lot of money to be able to make this work properly uh, on Android, OK? So, so what do we do in terms of Android? What we do is there's actually a chart that you can go get uh, from the Android developer website that shows you the breakdown. <coughs> I'm sorry, that shows you the breakdown of the different kinds of devices which are out there. And I'll just zoom in on this for a bit. Can you guys see that OK? All right? So if we just zoom in on this a bit, and this is slightly older. This, I think I took this graph maybe about three or four months ago. But it hasn't changed substantially. What we see is that a huge amount of deployed Android handsets, Android handsets that folks have out in the field, uh, a, a huge percentage of, of them are still running Android 2.2 and Android 2.3.3. And very, everything else is kind of almost negligible. Okay? And this makes it extremely difficult 
to try to plan ahead. Oops, went too far ahead. It makes it very difficult to add new features uh, and to support some of the newer features on Android 4 devices. It's where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your resources? Do you spend them on making sure that the experience is as, as nice as possible on the majority of these devices, or do you want to use some of the newer features that are, for example, in, in uh, Android 4.1, in Jelly Bean, and other things like that? Okay, especially for us as a small startup, we don't have a huge amount of resources to put into making the perfect app. And even if we did, would it make business sense to spend X thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to be able to support these extra iOS devices? Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. All right. So again, I talked about why this matters. It's all about application costs. You have software development, design UX, infrastructure and backend systems, marketing, uh, advertisements possibly, and social media management. So there's a lot that you have to do to be able to make your app successful. Uh, and, and where you spend your resources is very important, obviously, uh, but these are just some of the challenges that you face. Uh, we spend money in all of these different areas. Uh, but obviously, it's, we spend a lot more time, uh, time and resources on software development uh, and design and UX than the other things. Uh, but we, we try to be smart about how we do marketing uh, and advertisements and reaching out over social media, uh, both within the app and outside of the app in the web space. Okay? All right. Uh, so really quickly, how much does design and UX matter? Uh, the answer to this question is actually... Um, it actually is, it depends. If you're building a consumer app that's going to be used by consumers, design and UX matters almost more than anything else. So one of, the, one of the things that we often do at our company is that we'll spend more time and resources on design and UX than adding a new feature, because that's what's important. The consumer in the app space, because of Apple uh, primarily, they're expecting a very rich, very polished user experience. Okay? But if you're building business apps, it can be a totally different scenario. You may not need to spend that much time on UX and design. Uh, obviously, the UX matters a lot, uh, even, in the design, uh, even, in the business, uh, even in the business space, because uh, you're working not on a big 17, 19, 20-inch screen, i.e. a desktop, but you're working on a small device. And you have to be able to, to, to give even some basic user experience um, to a business user using it on a small device, whether it's a, 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 you know, a four inch Android phone or a nine inch or 10 inch iPad or Android tablet, okay? Because if the, the app is unusable, obviously, then it's not very good uh, for the, the customer no matter who it is. Okay, so um, one other thing that we spend uh, quite a bit of time debating initially is what category do, put, do you put your app into and how much does it really matter? All right, when I say category, I mean when you go into the iOS store or Android store, you know, you have business and you have travel and you have education and other categories like that. How do you know where to place your app? Because oftentimes your app can reasonably fit within multiple categories, right? So one of the decisions we made early on was that we wanted to be in a category where we could easily break into the top 100, top 50, et cetera, uh, for that app category. But we're a consumer-based product, so that means a lot to us. Right? If you're a business product uh, that has a you know, captured, pre-captured set of users, it may not make that much of a difference. But if you expect to sell it to other businesses uh, and it's not just something in-house or you have like a channel that you can already drive sales through, which category you put it in can make a huge difference. Okay? So, let's talk about the five different business app models. All right, and, and while I'm talking about these, if you're thinking about building an app or you already have an app, you may want to consider uh, which category does your app fit into, okay, or which biz model does your app fit into, and have you considered doing variations in case your plan A doesn't work out, right? Basically, what's your plan B if you decide to go freemium and that doesn't work? You know, what, what would you do in terms of restructuring the business around your app to be able to still be profitable with it? Okay. So the first case study. And again, this is, this, all the stuff I'm about to uh, show here, uh, it's been sanitized a little bit. I've done uh, interviews with other app developers that I meet uh, in Atlanta and in other places. 
and I've taken and distilled this research down into, uh, into these slides. So uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this stuff, but I will go into detail on this part right here. All right, so the first case study is the utility slash game app. You have a $1 price point, and there's no add-ons. Okay, this is what everyone is probably accustomed to. You go to the app store, you like Angry Birds, you can buy it for a dollar, and then you own it. Or you go to the app store, and you buy Remember the Milk, or whatever it may be, any one of these different apps. Okay? And for the app developer, they are essentially getting uh, that $1 minus whatever the Apple store takes, which is 30%, or what the Google Play Store takes, which is 25%. So that is your gross margin uh, for selling that one unit. Okay, so you're talking about uh, somewhere between uh, 75 to 70 cents, which is not a lot of money. Okay, so but for but for consumer apps, this is the game that you have to play. Uh, all right. So the second case study, and this is a little bit more interesting, is a subscription-based news app. Right, you basically have a $1 or $2 monthly price point, and you don't offer any in-app upgrades, i.e. add-ons. Right? Uh, now, one thing I should add to this, uh, the first case study, is that you don't necessarily not need to have add-ons. One of the ways that Angry Birds, for example, makes extra money from the sale of their app is they have add-ons that, that you can buy for usually a dollar. Right? So they have this thing called the Mighty Eagle, which allows you to destroy everything on the screen or something, right? But it costs a dollar. So you pay a dollar for the game, and then once you're hooked on the game, they present you with a set of in-app purchases that enhance the gameplay in some way, right? So other games, what they do is they provide you with uh, a way of uh, buying extra levels, for example, okay? But if you're, if you're, you're doing utility apps, uh, what a lot of people will do is they'll provide you extra content, or they'll provide you an extra feature, or whatever it may be, by doing an in-app purchase after the initial purchase price. So sometimes the barrier to entry is very low, again, $1, because that's what the consumer expects. But then they make extra profit by, or extra sales by offering some kind of feature-based upgrade within the application. And that's true for both games and utility and business apps, et cetera. It's done across the board if you go look um, at the different types of apps which are out there. And this is, for example, if you're in the education, uh, if you look at educational apps, a lot of them will offer you, for example, some basic, uh, at, at the point, at the time of purchase for $1, you'll get some basic set of lessons. But then if you want to have different lessons or more lessons, it'll be an extra dollar or $2 or whatever to give you the extra content once you're hooked on that specific app. Okay? But let's go back to the case study too. It's a subscription-based news app. Now, um, the, the Apple Store has the ability for automatic renewing purchases for your application. There is one caveat, though. So if you want to have somebody download your app and pay you a dollar or two dollars or five dollars every month, right, on a automatically recurring basis without the user having to approve that billing, uh, what they do is you have to be some kind of content-based app. So uh, that's where Apple draws the line. They say, if you so say, for example, uh, you're, you have some magazine for computer geeks, right? If you're providing content every month, they will allow you to set up automatic billing for your application so that the user doesn't do anything. You just get paid every month. However, for other kinds of apps, something that is not deemed content-based necessarily, uh, the user will be prompted every month to say, do you want to pay a dollar to get one more month's access or whatever, right? The, you basically, it prompts the user to say, your one month period for using this app is over. Do you want to continue using it? Click yes, pay a dollar, and then as an app developer, that's when you get paid. So obviously, that's, that presents a barrier to entry in some ways um, because a lot of people will say, well, I'm not really using this app, so no, cancel the subscription, okay? All right, so the third case study. This is a premium app, uh, sort of like Quick Office Pro. Quick Office Pro costs $20, it's a one-time price, and they don't necessarily have add-ons. Uh, and uh, what a lot of folks do is they do this kind of thing. So in the premium space, the premium space is actually very difficult because uh, the consumer is trained now to pay a dollar or two for an app, okay? 
That's not to say that folks aren't making money with premium apps like Quick Office Pro or OmniGraffle, which is charting software for the iPad. Okay, so um, what what a lot of folks think about when they see this is, well, okay, we'll just price it at whatever, 20 or 50 bucks, and that's close to what we're pricing for the desktop edition of our product. Uh, but it, it, unfortunately, it's not quite that clear cut. For example, OmniGraffle, I believe, costs $70 or something uh, for Mac OS X, whereas on the App Store, I believe they price it at either $14.99 or $20. So the, the, the pricing is totally different even though you have more or less the exact same feature set both on the desktop with Mac OS X and on the iPad with iOS. Okay, and and some, what some people do is they also uh, have a variation on this where they charge a one-time price and, and they also have in-app purchasing. Uh, however, this is not very popular because, uh, again, the consumer is trained to just pay that one price and get this stuff, especially in the premium space if you're paying 20 or 30 or $50 for something and then the app developer wants to nickel and dime you for a $5 upgrade for this or a $10 you know, content pack for that as part of your premium app, uh, you're, you're almost certain to go and get uh, negative reviews or one or two star reviews on the app store where, where people don't complain about how, much, you know, how great your app is and how well it runs. They'll come and complain about how you keep wanting to charge them for stuff, right? Because unfortunately, consumers don't understand the software business and that it costs, you know, it costs a lot of money to build software. Um, so, uh, so, so segueing off of this, uh, let's talk a little bit about price elasticity. Again, I want to talk, uh, I want to spend some time talking about pricing because I think this is very important. Pricing and positioning are the two kinds of two P's that I think about uh, on the App Store. Okay, so price elasticity, very simply defined, is the number of sales by the price of the product. Okay. So um, in this magic $1 economy, this is very difficult to understand because it doesn't follow the classic price elasticity models that you see for everything else in the retail space. Okay? Software by itself, obviously, is not something that is necessarily price elastic to begin with. But for general utilities uh, on the desktop, you do see that there is some price elasticity. As you lower the price, the number of units of software you sell go up. Right? And as you raise the price, the number of units of software you sell go down. However, in the App Store, you, you don't get perfectly elastic pricing. Okay? I mean, even in the real world, you don't get perfectly elastic pricing. But in the App Store, it's even wilder. Right? Uh, but one of the things that, I, one of the things that I, I, I ask folks who ask me about you know, building an app-based, app mobile app-based business is how can you build a business for a dollar per pop? Right? And then after Apple takes their cut, that's only 70 cents per user. Right? How, much, uh, how, how big can you scale, number one? And is your product so popular that uh, it, will generally, it will fit a general use case? Okay? And there's actually an interesting blog article online where an app developer basically says that pricing his product at $8 versus $1 was the right thing to do. The reason his rationale for this was I would rather have less users that I can provide better support for and target more features for a specific set of users rather than having something that's generally used by a lot of people and having that extra support overhead and the extra overhead from a back-end infrastructure point of view, et cetera, et cetera, to, to support uh, a, a, a very large number of users at a much lower price point. Um, so. Uh, I, if, if you're interested in that blog article, you can just uh, tweet out to me and I'll send you the link to that. But, but if people are starting, app developers are starting to understand that you don't necessarily have to price your product at, $8, at $1, especially if you have something that is a semi-niche or definitely a niche product. There are places, uh, there, there are things that you can do to be able to charge more and to be able to reach that audience that you want to reach of potential consumers and not have to be at that dollar price point, okay? So the consumer is very, very slowly changing, but they won't change until the app developers, i.e. us, until we change and say, okay, this is the pricing model that we're gonna use. We're not gonna charge a dollar anymore. We're gonna charge five bucks or $8 or $10 because we're offering this extra stuff and show to the consumer that indeed the product is worth it, okay? 
and in a lot of ways, this is, it, it, I find this to be a little bit humorous because we're talking about the difference between a dollar and five dollars, right? Uh, and so like later tonight when we leave the show uh, and we go out to dinner, uh, how much will we spend on a beer? We'll, we're in California, how much does a beer cost here? Like $12 an hour or something, I, I don't know. I'm just joking. I know it costs right around seven to eight dollars, right? But we won't even think about that purchase. When we go for dinner, we'll spend 20 or 30 or 40 the bucks, uh, depending, on not, depending if we're on expense account or not, um, and, and buy dinner. We, we won't even blink about spending 40 or 50 dollars on dinner However, your, your normal consumer, i.e. us, because we're also consumers, will think very, very deeply about that $1 or that $5 purchase, okay? And there's reasons behind that, and there's actually some science and studies around it, but uh, it's, a, a lot of it um, uh, has to do with the way folks think about software, uh, and, and that a lot of that is because uh, of us rather than the consumer themselves, right? The app developers, software developers. So again, just to uh, drive home the point about price elasticity, right? I said that the price is not perfectly elastic. So from some data that we've gathered for what we do and from other folks that I've talked to and looked at their, uh, their, some of their pricing uh, and, and their pricing over time, what we see is generally speaking, we, we see like these little gulfs. So the dollar is like a really strong price point because everybody's used to that. $4.99 is also a very strong price point, but there seems to be like this little gulf here in the middle between two and three and four dollars between the two, or between one and five dollars. And then after you go up from five dollars, you see a massive drop off at $5.99, $6.99, $7.99, $8.99, and then $9.99. You actually, we've actually seen these kinds of things that don't seem to be perfectly price elastic when pricing apps for the App Store, okay? All right, so a small rant on Apple. So I did a small rant on, uh, on Android, uh, so, so we can't leave Apple out of this. W one of the things that Apple did that really hurt uh, software developers, whether you're an independent software developer uh, or you have a st small startup like I do or you're a big company like EA Games, one of the things that Apple did was by artificially pricing apps to be at a dollar, they essentially created this stigma in consumers that, oh yeah, I can pay a dollar and I should get an awesome game, or I should get an awesome utility, or whatever. If it, it's actually quite humorous. If you go and look at reviews for some apps or games that are out there, for, for any little imperfection or for the fact that they try to upsell with in-app purchasing, there'll be loads of two, one, two, or three star reviews saying, oh, there's this little bug in the app, or they tried to upsell me something, so I'm gonna give them a one star review, or, or whatever it may be. Right, uh, and, and, and a lot of this has to do with the way Apple started with the App Store back in 2007 and 2008 by pricing and essentially driving app developers to price their applications at a artificially low price point. Because honestly, folks, you guys are app developers. Is $1 like an artificially low price point or not, right? It is, absolutely. No one, no one in this room will argue that as application developers. Right, because I have a friend here in the audience, Brian. He probably he lives here in San Francisco. He probably charges 200 bucks an hour for consulting, right? But if he wants to be an app developer, he you know he's probably thinking, am I going to sell my app for a dollar, or am I going to go out and do consulting and make guaranteed money over a course of time, uh, rather than you know trying to to buy that lottery ticket. And unfortunately, I think buying a lottery ticket is actually much easier. You just go, you buy a lottery ticket, you pay a dollar. I don't know how much it costs here. And, and, and we have mega millions in, in Georgia. You buy a lottery ticket for a dollar and you probably have slightly worse odds than spending weeks or months building an app and hoping that it makes it big on the App Store. So anyways, that's a small rant on Apple. Let's get back to our case studies. One of the things that we've seen is there's been a movement away from uh, apps, especially premium priced apps that would generally fit into the one, two, five, ten dollar category. Uh, and we've seen a lot of folks move towards a freemium model. Freemium basically means you, the consumer is able to download the app for free. The, so that totally reduces any barrier to entry for a consumer wanting to get an app. Because I'm sure, um, I, I know it won't be anybody in this room, but I'm sure you guys have friends who only have free apps on their phone, right? Or they may have a couple of apps that they paid money for, 
right? And your friend, he will balk at the thought of paying a dollar or, God, God forbid, five dollars to buy an app. So what you do is you completely remove that barrier for that large group of people, uh, especially those people on, on um, a platform such as <coughs> Android um, that uh, aren't necessarily uh, the kind of folks who spend money on apps because they, and this is something that Google has done, is they have driven app developers to essentially offering free apps with advertising. That's the last category, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the, the freemium type of app can really help reduce that initial barrier to entry. So people get the app and they get maybe a small content set or maybe they just get 10 levels in like Angry Birds or whatever it may be, right? You get some basic functionality and then once you have the user hooked on your app, you upsell them with in-app purchasing by selling them extra levels or extra content or whatever it may be that your application does, okay? Uh, and, and this is becoming quite popular because I think a lot of app developers, we've, as, as app developers, we've started to mature. We, we said, we, we tried the $1 thing and we said, you know, this is not sustainable as a business and we're not getting that many, as many folks as if it were free. So what's the next thing we can move on to? So a lot of people have moved into this space. Uh, and, and this is actually what one of the things we're doing at Triplingo is that we're moving away from being a premium priced app at eight or ten dollars and we're going for the freemium model to get that larger user base and then working on conversion later rather than doing conversion up front through app store reviews and uh, reviews on on app review websites or you know read write web or TechCrunch or whatever let's go the freemium route we capture a very large user base up front because the app is free and then we sell them premium content by charging a premium price okay so let's move on and talk about case study five. This is the free app. If you own any kind of Android device, you are familiar with this. You have free app with advertising in it. Okay. And this is, this, is like, this is actually one of the main differences between uh, the iOS uh, store and the Android Google Play market is most iOS users that chew the uh, in-app in advertising, whereas the Google user is like, oh, it's just an ad in the app. You know, whatever. They're, so it's, it's two different types of consumers here. But uh, the, it, you, this is very simple. You have a free app. It costs zero dollars, and it's advertising driven. Okay. So you get your standard uh, impression. Uh, you get a, a standard rate for an impression for an advertisement in your app, and then obviously you get some kind of rate for a click through, depending on what kind of uh, application and what kind of advertisement it is um, within the application. Now, this sounds like the way to go for a lot of folks, right? But uh, I'll warn you on this. Okay, I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying it, it, it sounds good on the surface uh, because, you know, we, we're all used to the web, you know, with Google and, and AdMob and all these other uh, 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 advertising platforms on the web that have fairly good conversions for a lot of folks, a lot of application developers, web developers. Um, what, from the research I've done, and this is for Google mobile ads. So Google actually pushes ads onto iOS platforms too, right? They don't just push ads, mobile ads onto uh, Android platform. You can actually put Google mobile ads uh, into iOS apps as well, okay? But 80% of the revenue that comes from Google, mo Google mobile ads comes ironically from iOS devices. So you have an iOS developer that's using Google mobile ads in their iOS application. 80% of the revenue comes from iOS and only 20% from Android. Okay, and that's reflected in the next numbers on the screen in terms of advertising, uh, the, the app rev revenue from advertising. Okay, and these are estimated figures. Okay, so you get an idea of uh, the, the discrepancy in the advertising revenue that can be generated between iOS and Android, okay? And if you guys remember, uh, with the, the new Kindle Fires that just came out from Amazon, uh, one of the options, uh, or, or one of the things that you could not opt out of with the new devices uh, on the, the Amazon Kindle Fire platforms, now they have three of them, uh, was that you, you weren't able to opt out of ads, but since the initial announcement and their initial 
statement that you can't, a user cannot opt out of ads. Uh, a user can opt out of ads on the platform itself, not from the, your application, but from the Kindle Fire operating system, which is a variant of Android. I think you can pay like an extra 15 or 20 bucks and remove those ads from your device uh, as long as you own it. Okay? All right. So uh, let's wind down a bit and well, save some time for questions. Um, let's talk about sales channels. So uh, a, a lot of folks that I've talked to who build apps rely solely on the, again, the Apple iOS store, uh, app store, the Google Play market, uh, the Nook color market, or the Nook market, uh, which is by Barnes and Nobles, uh, the Amazon market, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So they basically, they just throw their app out there and they rely on sales coming directly from there. Uh, what, other, what folks have started to do is um, how do we do direct sales, not indirect sales through the App Store? Because putting it out on the App Store, that's a channel, right? The App Store is one single channel. How can we also do direct sales? How can we find a user on our own on the web or do a partnership with somebody over here, okay, and get that person, their, their group of users, their community of users, to come into our app and buy our application, okay? But unfortunately, this brings up a lot of questions in terms of how do you manage direct sales, right? Essentially, you're selling directly now, no longer indirectly through the App Store uh, using, using a third-party platform. You're actually going out and you yourself are finding users and saying, hey, buy this application. It's awesome. How do you manage something like that, okay? So uh, th this is, th this is a, a great question. So one of the things that uh, one of the challenges around this, for example, is say you have a nice website or you buy advertising for your specific application on the, on the desktop web or even on the mobile web, okay? One of the, the key technical challenges around this is when a user clicks on your ad and they come to your website saying how awesome your app is, and they say, oh yeah, I want to buy this app. And then they click on a little button that drops them into the Google Play Store or into the Apple iOS App Store. How do you, they, how do you know that they've made that jump to the store? For, because you paid for an ad for somebody to come from, let's say TechCrunch or wherever, some major web uh, outlet. They come to your site now, they're looking at your application page on your website, and then they click, okay, let's go buy it. And then they make that final jump uh, either into iTunes uh, or into the, the Google uh, Play Store, there's no way to know if they've actually purchased something at that last step. So tracking the uh, click-through rate is easy from until the very last step, and then tracking the conversion rate that you get until the last step is very difficult. Okay? So this is what I mean by how do you manage direct sales. All right, so finally, uh, what we did in this session is we went over the categories of the different application businesses that you can put together. Uh, we talked a little bit about pricing. Uh, we skipped over marketing a little bit. We have a few minutes, so I'm gonna go back to that really quickly. Um, and we talked a little bit about sales and the things around that. So let's go back a bit. Let's just talk a few minutes and I was able to get through this relatively quickly and talk very briefly about marketing. So in terms of marketing, from the folks that I've talked to and what we do at Triplingo is we basically use these different types of marketing outlets. We have your standard web outlets, right? And this is not advertising. This is just straight marketing, okay? Standard web outlets, Read Write, Read Write Web, TechCrunch, other things like that, okay? We basically reach out to them, send them a free copy of the app or whatever it may be, ask them to review it, if they review it and put it up, that's awesome. That's something that we have out there. And hopefully you get a good review that will help drive some sales. Uh, there's also local news outlets that can be used depending on the type of application that you have. Uh, this is something that can, uh, that can work uh, reasonably well in terms of spending some time and money into marketing, into, into local outlets. Okay? And, and finally, uh, the app review sites. Uh, we don't actually spend a lot of time going to app review sites. Uh, I know there's, there's, a, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any solid leaders uh, either in the iOS or the Android space for websites that just do application reviews. 
okay, mobile app reviews. So that's why I have the, your mileage may vary on this one. Uh, it's one of those things where, yes, it's great that they review your application and you, know, you get some extra traffic that helps promote and market your application. But in terms of the type of conversion you get from using an app review site, um, and, and, and then on top of that, purchasing possibly a, uh, some advertising on app review sites, uh, the jury's out on this one. If you go and look at the things that people have reported back after trying to especially use advertising on app review sites, you can get kind of a mixed bag of results. Okay? And obviously there are other ways that you can get the marketing out. Uh, depending on the type of application you have, if you have a niche type of app uh, that, uh, that targets moms, for example, or students, right? you can do marketing directly at a local university or through a university newspaper or university website to be able to get the word out about your specific application. Okay? So uh, one thing, I already mentioned this before, uh, the, the using um, advertising for driving traffic to your application. So uh, here's just some numbers that we've gathered. Uh, the, these, these numbers obviously change depending on where you advertise and things like that. But this, the, it's not the absolute terms of the numbers that's important here. It's the relative numbers through each step of the stage or, or each stage in the, the process of someone seeing an advertisement, and then getting a conversion on that person on the web. And again, this is web or mobile web, okay? So in one example, what we saw is that there's a 0.4% click-through rate, an average of a six-second view time uh, once they're, they've clicked through and gone to your website from that ad, and it costs 60 bucks a month. This is on a specific app review site uh, that I won't mention, but you know, again, it's, it's more about the... The, the, the numbers there, the, the relative numbers, not the absolute numbers, okay? And then for another app review site, you see you get uh, one to maybe 5% click-through rate from this other website, and then a approximate 24-second view time uh, once they're on your website, and something like this costs $30 a month. What are we missing here? The final step in this puzzle, right? So you spend 30 bucks a month, you see a click-through rate of about this, someone spends about this much time on your website looking at the, the description and screenshots or whatever of your mobile app. How many of those people bought your application? There's no way to know. Because when they click that link to go into the iTunes store or into the Google Play market and they buy it and whatever, you know, and then they essentially close, they close the sale of that, there's no way to, there's no way to uh, track that that is, um, th that, that is reliable. Okay? There's a lot of people looking into this because this is a huge problem, especially for folks who want to, um, who, who want to sell mobile advertising. Right? How do you go from step A to step B and finally to step C to conversion? Okay? So anyways, with that, I just got the five minute signal, so it looks like we finished just on time. We have a few minutes for questions. So thanks for coming, and um, we have a few minutes for questions, so I will take some questions for a few minutes. Yes, sir. Okay, so, so the, uh, the, the question here is, is uh, the question is, uh, on the basically the resource side, right? How much money and time do you spend building an app? Right. And 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 specifically, the question is right. And the specifically, the question is targeted at: um, Should I build native iOS and Android? Should I use PhoneGap? Should I use something like an app dev platform like Anska Corona or AppCelerator Titanium? Right. Um, <laughs> I actually do a full a full two hour talk on that exact topic, but I'll distill it for you like this. Uh, it depends. No, I'm just joking. Um, no, actually, I don't think it really matters. Okay, I think the big differentiator between whether or not you want to go into one of, you know, if you want to do native, phone gap, or use the app dev platform, uh, a lot of that has to do with the type of app you're developing for what's the eventual target, right, uh, and, and the pricing around it. But, but I, I think 
Like for example, what we do is at Triplingo, we actually use titanium. We built everything on it. But we knew out of the gate that we wanted to have awesome user experience because we're in the consumer space. And we needed to be able to develop for iOS and for Android. And we're a startup, so we don't have a huge amount of resources. But even if we had a huge amount of resources, would, would I want to have two development teams, four or five guys working on iOS, four or five guys working on Android, and you know, you're talking about a huge staff now, right? Or can I just get away with having four or five guys that know this one app dev platform really well, and maybe a couple of the guys know iOS deep and, and Android deep, and we can build it out. So that's what we do. Right? Because we, we made that decision and we looked at all the, the, the different options and we eventually came to that conclusion that that was the best thing for us to do. No, absolutely not. What, what we found with using uh, an app dev platform like Accelerator Titanium is that we're able to actually crank out features cross-platform really, really fast because you're working at the high level, you know, at the app dev, at the app, basically a platform level rather than at the rather than at the nuts and bolts level you know down at the objective c with the ui widget and this and that or down over here in android at the com.android.button you know all this it's very very low level down here when you get talk about the native world but with these especially with something like titanium we're working more with with um, higher level constructs which, which increases our development time, or I should say it increases our development velocity substantially. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Question. Of the total number of apps that are delivered, mm -hmm. what percentage roughly would you say you freemium? Okay, so the question is, of the total number of apps delivered, what percentage are freemium? Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for that question. Yeah, I, I, if I had to guess, and this is just a wild-ass guess, yes. I would say that today um, we see maybe 25 to 30 percent freemium. Okay, just based on my research and the total wild guess, I could be completely off, but just off the apps that I use and the apps that I look at and folks that I know who are building apps, about 25 to 30 percent, right? And the the others are either paid for or are free. Right. So exactly. So my point earlier was that what what I've seen as a trend is that app developers are moving more towards freemium over the last, let's say, year to 18 months, six months. Over the, basically, it's been a growing trend uh, and for the two reasons I talked about earlier. It's to get that larger user base and then worry about conversion later and having a, a, a no bar barrier to entry for the user to, to get your application. Okay, so the question is, are there any third-party sites that target freemiums? I don't know of any off the top of my head. Um, from what I've, what I've seen, I'm just trying to think. Um, I, I haven't seen, the app review sites generally do everything, right? People don't generally tend to target the freemium space in terms of app review sites and other things like that, so. Okay, any more questions? Can't see. Okay, well, thanks for coming to the session. We're exactly at 2 o'clock, so um, if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter or send me an email, and be happy to follow up with you. Thanks, everybody.